the controversy over stucco explained. I'm gonna do something I don't usually do, and that is talk in detail about actual building code requirements. In all of my teaching and really in my own professional education, I've always prioritized understanding the technical aspect of how real buildings perform over what the rules are. I think this is sensible for most architects. Obviously the rules matter, but we shouldn't be using the rules as a substitute for technical competence, experience, and professional judgment. With that in mind, let's talk first about what's going on with stucco failures, the technical part, and then let's talk about what the rules are and why there's so much controversy over the rules themselves. Most walls in North American residential and commercial construction are drained walls. Drained walls have a cladding that sheds water and a water control material and drainage space behind the cladding to protect the rest of the assembly. Windows, doors, and service penetrations are sealed to the water control membrane. The building codes refer to this membrane as the water resistive barrier, WRB. This water management strategy permits us to build out of lightweight, moisture sensitive materials. The water control membrane, airspace, and cladding work together to protect the moisture sensitive materials behind them. The water control membrane protects the most moisture sensitive components of the wall, sheathing, framing, insulation, and drywall. The cladding sheds water and the airspace between them provides one, a capillary break, two, drainage for liquid water that bypasses the cladding, and three, moisture removal by air exchange, drying. It's important to note that the cladding will dry into this airspace when it gets wet after a rain, but the interior parts of the wall will also dry into this space. The moisture sensitive parts of the wall behind the water control membrane get wet from small discontinuities in the water control membrane from fasteners that hold the cladding in place, for example, minor construction defects, and from interior sources such as people breathing, cooking, cleaning, etc. When we think of water management in drained walls, we tend to focus on the water control membrane itself. The building codes have long required the inclusion of a water control membrane or water resistive barrier in drained walls. But these membranes are never completely watertight and have always relied on drainage and ventilation to be effective. This is not because the membranes are defective, nor is it because they have been incorrectly installed. Water control membranes have always been designed to be used as part of a system of water management, and that system requires both drainage and ventilation, drying, to be effective. So while our focus tends to be on the character of that water resistive barrier, the single lowest cost, most effective way of reducing the risk of water related failures in wood framed exterior walls is actually to provide dedicated drainage and ventilation behind the cladding. Now, the inclusion of a water control membrane in drained walls is standard, but the code provisions related to the drainage and ventilation space behind the cladding continue to evolve in response to the complexity of modern materials and the combinations in which we use them. So for example, the code appropriately requires a one inch gap behind brick claddings in drained walls. For stucco clad wood framed walls, the code requires a second water control membrane installed over the first. Many people assume that the purpose of the second layer is to provide an extra barrier to water in the event that the first layer fails. But this is incorrect. The purpose of the second layer is to prevent the stucco, which is installed wet, from sticking to the first layer, thereby providing a small space for drainage and drying. We know from experience, however, that this second layer provides insufficient drainage and drying behind stucco claddings in a lot of climates. What's surprising to a lot of people, even building industry professionals, is that even in wet climates, we really only need a very small space for drainage behind our claddings larger spaces behind our claddings and in front of our water control membranes are useful not because we need enhanced drainage, but because we need enhanced drying. 
this drying space is especially helpful in mitigating solar vapor drive when we use what's called a reservoir cladding in a rainy climate. Reservoir claddings are claddings that hold a lot of water, such as brick, stucco, adhered stone, and unpainted cedar shakes, for example. What happens with solar vapor drive is that after rain saturates the cladding, say brick, the sun will come out, shine on that wet brick, causing it to dry in both directions. Water vapor is driven into the wall behind the brick and it can overwhelm the wall's capacity to store and redistribute water, causing rot, mold, and odors. One way to deal with solar vapor drive is to simply not use a reservoir cladding, right? But suppose we are using a reservoir cladding. Then we have two options. We can encourage a lot of air exchange in that ventilation space between the cladding and the WRB to provide drying. We basically flush that moisture out before it gets into the wall. But if that cavity is too small, or if there's another reason we don't get much air exchange, for example, that cavity is clogged with mortar droppings, then we won't get enough drying to avoid the problem. Another option to mitigate solar vapor drive behind reservoir claddings is to control the permeance of the WRB. If we select a less permeable water control membrane, we can prevent wetting that way and don't require quite as much air exchange in that cavity. So we, can, we can tolerate a smaller cavity. When attempting to codify drainage and drying requirements, there are so many variables, climate, sheathing material, permeance of the water control membrane, the size of the drainage and ventilation space, and the cladding type, that coming up with a universally applicable requirement that still permits designers flexibility in material selection is really difficult. And in North America, we have struggled to do this, particularly with respect to stucco and adhered stone claddings. The leaky condo crisis in Western Canada in the 1990s was largely due to insufficient drainage and drying behind stucco claddings. And it caused such extensive damage, rotting, sheathing, and mold, that it bankrupted British Columbia's warranty program. The Canadian codes now have robust provisions for drainage behind all claddings, including stucco. We're seeing similar failures in rainy climates, those that receive 20 inches of rain or more per year, throughout the United States. Rotting walls behind stucco and adhered stone are the subject of multi-million dollar class action lawsuits. In my forensic practice, I have come across this failure many times throughout my career and have presented on the topic frequently. In response to these well-documented failures, the 2021 versions of both the IBC and IRC include provisions for um, enhanced drainage behind stucco claddings. And at a minimum, I recommend following these codes. However, the code provisions are confusing and they are the subject of intense lobbying on the part of water control membrane manufacturers attempting to gain an advantage by restricting the use of their competitors' products, particularly by making drainage requirements dependent on the category of water control membrane that's used, type one or type two. These category distinctions, type one or type two, among water control membranes are not relevant to the problem. This is a drainage issue, not a membrane failure issue. And the category distinctions serve only to obscure the issue and delay code protections for homeowners. A code that lags behind expert consensus in the industry also puts competent and ethical builders in the difficult position of voluntarily taking a cost increase that their less competent and less ethical competitors will not. Lack of legal recourse for homeowners in certain jurisdictions can further contribute to the problem. So let's take a closer look at these code provisions. Rather than simply provide the code reference, I think it would be helpful to actually show you the code language to illustrate the needless complexity of the provisions related to stucco. The section I'm about to show you is from the 2021 IRC, but the IBC has nearly identical language. 
The first relevant section relates to water resistive barriers more generally. That's section R703.7.3 and it basically just requires that we include a WRB in drained walls no matter where we are and no matter what the cladding is. So, so far so good. When the code discusses stucco claddings, it separates the requirements into two categories. There are provisions for dry climates and there are provisions for wet climates. Now, all the action and the problems are in the wet climate provisions, but since the wet climate provisions reference the dry climate provisions, we're gonna start there. In dry climates, the code gives us two options. The first option is to simply include a second water resistive barrier over the first. The second option permits us to keep just the single WRB if it's behind either rigid insulation or a drainage mat, and this is fine. But there's this curious provision here related to the type of WRB. If we wanna use two layers of WRB, they can be type one, but if we use just one layer with a drainage mat or insulation, the WRB has to be type two per ASTM E2256. So what's that about? The type one, type two designations have to do with the water holdout performance of the WRB, supposedly. The general idea is that type one WRBs are not as robust as type two WRBs. But the way the types are determined has nothing to do with the in-service performance of water control membranes and really shouldn't be referenced by the codes at all. To qualify as a type two membrane, we take a horizontal sample of a material and place an open tube or, or cylinder on top, sealing the base of the cylinder to the sample. Then approximately 22 inches of water is placed in the cylinder and left there for five hours, and none of it is supposed to leak through the sample. This is just silly. First of all, we don't install water control membranes horizontally, and second of all, 22 inches of water is about 112 PSF, which is the equivalent of an approximately 212 mile per hour wind. And remember, we're doing this for five hours. For reference, the highest wind speed during Hurricane Katrina was 175 miles per hour. So this is just a silly test to subject a water control membrane to. It doesn't match in-service performance, and it doesn't take all kinds of other relevant factors into account. And anyway, our stucco problems are not related to insufficient water holdout. They're due to insufficient drainage and insufficient drying. But so far, we're just talking about dry climates and we don't really have a problem in dry climates. While the code language is needlessly complicated, it's really pretty easy to comply with the code by just installing two layers of WRB. The second layer isn't that expensive or difficult to install. Now that said, for the sake of clarity and simplicity, we could replace all of this complicated code language for, for dry climates with the following sentence. A second water resistive barrier or plastic insulating sheathing or other non-water absorbing layer or design drainage space shall be installed over the water resistive barrier. See how easy that is? Okay, but let's shift our attention to the code requirements for stucco in wet climates. And here's where the shenanigans really start. We again have two options. The first option permits us to use whatever WRB we want, but requires us to pair that WRB with a 3 16 inch drainage space. This is a perfectly sensible update that was included in the 2021 version of the code. And essentially, the code is telling us that in wet climates, we require more drainage and drying, and we get that by replacing the second flat water resistive barrier with a drainage mat that's at least 3 16 inch thick. And this is what I recommend to my clients. But drainage mat is more expensive than a second layer of water resistive barrier, and it may be overshooting the mark in some applications, which is why there's an alternate path for compliance for wet climates. Instead of using a drainage mat, the code now gives us the option of using a membrane with 90% drainage efficiency if we pair it with one of those type two WRBs. On the face of it, this seems fairly reasonable. This alternate path is essentially an exception to the enhanced drainage required by the drainage mat. 
it introduces this new 90% drainage efficiency standard as a substitute for the drainage mat so long as the WRB is better at water holdout, meaning type two. It's basically a drainage reduction credit for using a better water resistive barrier. But there are two problems with this. The first is that the water holdout capacity of the water control membrane as measured by ASTM E2556 is not relevant to the problem. This is a drainage and ventilation issue, not a water holdout issue. What is relevant here though, is the water vapor permeance of the water control membrane. Remember our discussion of solar vapor drive. We still need a small amount of drainage, but we can reduce the amount of ventilation and drying when the water control membrane has a lower permeance to water vapor. So we can reduce the thickness of the drainage space if we provide some form of vapor control. And the second problem is that drainage efficiency is not a very good metric to use behind stucco claddings. Drainage efficiency was a concept developed for a very specific application behind expanded polystyrene foam insulations in the context of EFS cladding systems. And it's being used here inappropriately and in a way that needlessly favors particular manufacturers. It would be more simple, transparent, and technically appropriate to use the depth of the space that any given material provides as the determining factor for drainage and ventilation. A more sensible exception to the drainage mat requirement in item one would be to permit less thick and less expensive textured water control membranes that provide a smaller space than drainage mats as the second layer when we provide vapor control. And that vapor control can come from the textured membrane or it can come from the WRB, either one, as long as one of them has a water vapor permeance of less than 20 perms. In other words, a drainage reduction credit is permitted when the designers provide a measure of vapor control, not enhanced water holdout, which isn't relevant. So here's my proposed alternative code language. You can pause the video and screenshot it if you like. The idea is that in wet climates, you can use whatever water control membrane you wish with a drainage mat, or instead of the drainage mat, you can use a textured building wrap as long as either the textured building wrap or the WRB provides some measure of water vapor control. This is as manufacturer neutral as possible, permitting the maximum combinations of water control membranes, textured membranes, drainage mats, and insulations. All existing code approved water resistive barriers can be used with a drainage mat in the enhanced drainage option, the baseline, and all of the most common existing textured membranes qualify for the reduced drainage option as long as there's a provision for vapor control. The one manufacturer related point of interest here is that some of the most popular textured membranes also satisfy the vapor control requirements, like for example, Tamlin drainable house wrap and Benjamin Opdyke's hydro gap, and some do not, like for example, DuPont Tyvek drain wrap and VaproShield's wrap shield RS. However, the vapor control requirement can be easily and inexpensively satisfied either with standard asphalt impregnated felts, number 15 and number 30, or with most exterior insulations. Now this will still of course be a point of contention because in any multi-component system, manufacturers prefer to sell all of the components themselves. However, the codes exist to serve the public, not to help manufacturers sell products. And that's really what's been driving all of this type one, type two, so-called drainage efficiency silliness. So that's an explanation of the controversy, but what should you actually do? In dry climates, two layers of WRB still works fine. In wet climates and on any higher risk building, like one that's tall or that doesn't have any overhangs, I'd recommend pairing your water control membrane with an actual drainage mat behind stucco and adhered stone claddings. In a pinch, you can replace the drainage mat with a textured building wrap as long as one of the membranes is 20 perms or less. But I highly recommend the extra forgiveness of the drainage mat. And finally, apply a healthy dose of skepticism to these kinds of manufacturer performance claims based on lab tests 
rather than first principles and in-service performance.